Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father, from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. The text for this morning's sermon is the epistle lesson taken from Paul's letter to the Romans. We especially emphasize verses 22 through 24, where Paul writes, This righteousness from God comes through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. There is no difference, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. Don't worry, I've got this. These are words that we hear and maybe even say a lot these days. We say, don't worry, I've got this, and we want people to know that everything's taken care of. Every, the situation is under control, that they're in good hands, that we'll take care of business. The star basketball player on the team tells his coach that he wants to take the last shot of the game. He says, don't worry, I've got this. Maybe you go out to a restaurant and your waiter brings you the wrong order. And if you're anything like me, you're kind of nervous to complain to the waiter, you know, so I don't want to say anything. But then there's that brave person that you're with. They speak up and they say, don't worry, I've got this. We hear this, this phrase a lot, and really it's, a, it's all about the I in the phrase, I've got this. Society teaches us to be reliant upon ourselves, it teaches self-reliance, as a virtue, it teaches us not to rely on other people because we know how to do things right. We know how to do things our way, and so if we can control the situation, we'll do it right. But if somebody else tries to do it, they'll just mess it up. So we don't want to leave it to somebody else to do. We like to take control. And this I've got this mentality extends into all aspects of our life. You know, we look at our life, we, we think I did this and that. I put myself through school. I got this job. I'm taking care of myself. I don't need anybody else. And so this I've got this mentality extends sometimes even to our spiritual life. We think that we can control everything. Since we're so trustworthy in other aspects of our life, maybe we're tr trustworthy enough, maybe we're capable enough to control our standing with God, to control our righteousness. So we like to look within ourselves for things to trust. We can hear week after week how God has already done everything, how there's nothing we can contribute to our salvation, how God has taken care of it all. But we still, just by nature, tend to rely on ourselves. We tend to look inside of ourselves for things to trust. Sometimes we do this almost by accident. We don't even realize maybe that we're doing it, but it's such a natural impulse that we start to do it. And so we look for comfort and assurance inside ourselves instead of always looking at God. So we kind of run down the list of things that, that we feel good about ourselves for. You know, we go to, to church regularly, check. We volunteer, check. We tithe and we give to good causes, check. We're good, we're good people. The majority of the time, maybe not 100% of the time, but the majority of the time, we are good, check. And so... We hear over and over again how we can't control our standing with God, but we sometimes think we do. We th our thoughts, the things that we think, say, and do sometimes reflect a reliance on ourselves and a reliance on our good character and what we do. This is just the way that we are wired. In our text for today, Paul is writing to the Christians in Rome, and he's kind of asking this question, you know, where does righteousness come from? Does it come from the works of the law, or does it come from faith in Christ? Or does it come from some combination of the two? It's helpful to remember the, the original context in which Paul was writing. He was giving the message to the Jews and the Gentiles both that now the Gentiles were part of God's people. They were part of God's righteous people because of their faith in Christ. But see, the Jews, they were a little mixed up, kind of like we get mixed up sometimes. They were trying to tell the Gentiles that faith in Christ, that's a great thing, but it's not the whole story. There's also something else to add to it. So they were trying to get the Gentiles to do many of the same things that they do, following the law. Told them that they needed to be circumcised, that they needed to, to follow all the food laws and the religious observances that they were doing. 
See, the Jews were looking inside. They were taking comfort in the fact that they were Jewish, that they were God's chosen people, that God had given the law to them as, as a nation to set them apart from all the other nations of the world. And so we hear, even in the gospel reading today, the Jews bragging to Jesus. They were saying that we are Abraham's descendants. That's what they're taking comfort in. That's where they, they see themselves having a standing with God based on that, based on things about themselves. That's where they get their credentials, is what they thought. And sometimes we are just like the Jews in this, in this text, measuring ourselves up against the law, trying to find comfort, trying to trust in things that we can do, things that we can measure. Sometimes we think that if our good outweighs our bad, then we're fine. We think that if we can tip the scales in our favor, even just 51% to 49%, 51% good, then we're fine. But that is wrong. If we want to willingly measure ourselves up against the law, maybe we should read the fine print in God's law. And the fine print tells us that God's law demands perfection. There's no wiggle room there. There's no margin for error in God's law. We have broken it all. We know that we are all sinful from birth. We have that sinful nature, and every impulse that we have by nature is to go against God's law. It's to go against what he tells us to do. For those of you who have children, you know that you do not have to teach your kids how to sin. They just know that. They pick that up pretty quickly. You don't have to teach a little kid how to tell a lie or how to be selfish. But you do have to teach them the right way to behave, the right way to live according to what God has told us. Sometimes we buy toys or electronic devices that, that say batteries not included. But when you have a baby, the sinful nature comes included and fully guaranteed for life. Sin is just built in for all of us. And so that's what makes it so silly sometimes when we try to measure ourselves up against the law, when we try to look for the, to the law for comfort. Because we know that the law is not God's power for salvation. Thanks be to God that it is not, because if it were, we would be hopeless and helpless, because we know that we break it. We know that we are sinful from the moment we are conceived, from the moment we are created. We are sinful. So if the law is not God's power for salvation, then what is it? Well, one of the uses the law has is as a mirror. It's a mirror that shows us our sin. When we look at God's law, when we look at the Ten Commandments and, and uh, look at the small catechism that Luther wrote, we see the meanings that he attaches to the commandments telling us all the ways that we break it and all the ways that we can keep it. It's an eye-opening experience. It's like looking into a mirror and seeing ourselves for the first time because we see all the ways that we fail. We see that there's nothing really inside of us to trust, nothing to, to latch onto for security. But we see in that mirror how we are stained with sin. And so we know that the, nothing comforting can ever come from the law for us. The law will never declare us to be righteous in God's eyes. But no, Instead, the law always accuses us and always condemns us. And so, we should be worried about this because we don't have this one. So the law charges us with sin and we stand before God guilty as charged. We know that God is a just God. He is a fair and righteous judge. And we know that no one could blame God at all if he decided to call us guilty, to condemn us forever. That would be, he'd be well within his rights to do that. He has this law and we have broken it. But thanks be to God that he does not do that. Sin is completely our problem. It's our burden to carry. But God makes it his problem. God steps in. He doesn't just sit back and watch us and see us in this terrible predicament with our sin and then say, oh, well, I, I, I see you in a bad spot there. I, I really hope things work out for you. Best of luck to you. No, he does not do that. Instead, he steps in, and he takes that problem on for himself. See, God demands a sacrifice for sin, but then he's actually the one who provides that sacrifice. If you, if you remember the story of Abraham and Isaac, 
God commands Abraham to take his only son Isaac and sacrifice him. And Abraham, by faith, trusting in God, is, is prepared to do that. He has Isaac on the altar, and he's ready to sacrifice him to the Lord. But then God steps in and says, don't do that. And he actually provides the sacrifice. He provides a ram there in the bushes, and he provides the sacrifice that he demands. And that's the way that he does it here with us, too. He provides the sacrifice of his son, Jesus Christ. We are not righteous, but we know that God is righteous, and he shows us that righteousness in a big way. God shows his righteousness to us not in the law, but in Christ. He shows us that righteousness. When we see Christ, we see the way that God has chosen to deal with us. We understand the mind and the heart of God when we see Jesus. We see that grace and that mercy and that love that he has decided to to just pour out upon us in his Son who has come to save us from our sins. And that's when we see how God, how much God loves us, even though we don't deserve it. Sin is a serious problem, though, and that's why somebody has to take the blame. And Jesus is the one who voluntarily takes the blame. Jesus takes the fall for all of our sins. When I was in my first year of seminary just a couple years ago, I had a professor that was unlike any other professor I've ever had. First day of class, he gave us a syllabus, and it had a list of about 10 different papers that we had to do during the 10-week quarter. And there were no due dates, though, on the, on the syllabus. It was kind of weird. So I, my classmates and I were pretty puzzled, and he told us, doesn't matter when you do these papers, just have them done by the last week of class. You'll each come in individually and have a meeting with me, and I'll grade all of your work right then and there in front of you. Well, I, I kind of freaked out about that. First of all, I'm kind of a procrastinator sometimes, so I, I like due dates. But also, I was kind of scared to go face this, this mini judgment day where I'd have to bring all my work in and have him grade it in front of me. Now, thankfully, I made it through the class. But this is kind of like the situation that we are in with our sin. You see, we have all of this, these papers, a stack of papers, this work that we have worked hard to complete. We have to bring it into the judge. And maybe we think that the papers are good. Maybe we're proud of the work that we have done. Maybe we think we've got a stack of, of grade A papers. But then the judge starts looking at paper after paper, and it's just a bunch of trash, just filthy rags, bad work, and he's failing us for paper after paper. And so we're staring at a big fat F. But Jesus walks through that door of that office and he's got a stack of papers himself that he's carrying. Jesus says to us, don't worry, I've got this. So he points to our papers and he says, those are mine. And then he gives us his stack of perfect work, his A plus work, he gives that to us. He takes all of our garbage work that we have done he disposes of it completely, takes all of our sin and takes it away. And he gives us all of his perfect work, all of his righteousness, he gives it to us as a free gift. We say that God is just. We also say that he is the justifier. Kind of a cool nickname. Maybe we should, we should apply to God more often, the justifier. When we say that God justifies us, we mean that he declares us not guilty. He declares us righteous because of what Christ has done for us. He declares us not guilty, even though we do not deserve that by any means. This is the main teaching of the scripture, that God, by his grace, that we just can't even comprehend, his grace blows our mind, but by his grace, he forgives us for the sake of Christ. This is the gospel this is the promise of forgiveness that comes only through faith in Jesus Christ. And this is the very heart of the gospel. This is where we see God's heart. He shows his heart to us, shows us that love and mercy that he pours out upon us in his son. We know that by faith we receive this and that God does not count our sins against us anymore. That is the gospel message, the message that that he sees his son Christ when he looks at us. He sees us cleansed by the power of his blood. 
This is the gospel that we celebrate today, especially on this Reformation Day. We celebrate and rejoice in the privilege that we get to hear this saving message week after week and day after day. We can open up his word and see how much God loves us and how he tells us this gospel message, how he has prepared this salvation for us in Christ. So it's such great news. We rejoice knowing that we don't have to trust. We don't have to look in ourselves anymore. There's nothing in there to trust anyway, but we don't have to search. We don't have to make a futile attempt to measure up against the law. So where then should we still use the law is kind of the question that maybe is on our minds. And Paul asks this very question. In a few verses after our text ends here, in verse 31 of Romans chapter 3, Paul says, should we then nullify the law? Basically, should we throw it out? Should we just toss it aside? But then Paul answers his very own question. He says, not at all. Rather, we uphold the law. And what Paul means here is that even though the law doesn't save us, the law still has a place for us in our lives. See, we talked about how the law has this use of being a mirror that shows us our sin. But the law also has a few other uses, and one of those uses is as a guide. So the law can be used as a guide for living as God's forgiven people. The law can guide us and show us how we are to live, how we are to live in the gospel, in, in the freedom from sin that we have, that Christ has purchased and won for us with his precious blood on the cross. But we know that there's nothing in that law to boast in. There's nothing there for us to boast in. Because we will continue to fall short. But what we have to boast in is the gospel. That is the power of God for the salvation of those who believe. The gospel, that is what we boast in. We boast in Christ alone. And that is the gospel message that we proclaim. The message that it is by God's grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, that we are made his righteous and forgiven and redeemed children. So we don't have to worry anymore because we trust in Christ. So don't worry. He's got this. In the name of Jesus, amen. And now may the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen.